Hello everyone, welcome to lecture number seven. Today's topic is load balancing. Last time we talked about microservices and a few other topics like uh, single page applications and cross-platform designs. So the main idea last time was that uh, a service can be composed of not just one code base, but many different components that, that interact with each other through networked APIs. So a, a design that has just one uh, application like the Wikipedia media wiki design that we talked about earlier on in the class that's called a monolithic design and an alternative to that is to break your code base into, into little pieces that are more specialized called microservices generally your uh, client like the outside user will still connect to just one service but then a lot of the work is done by um, making requests to other microservices inside so these microservices are, like any service, um, are black boxes, meaning that they expose network APIs and don't, and, and the user of it, which is in this case to say the other services that interact with it, don't need to know too much about what's happening internally. They can be coded up in different languages. Um, by breaking your service into microservices that um, expose only network APIs, you can decouple development of different parts of your system so so that you can have a team uh, split in pieces you know working on on different parts in parallel and um, whereas with a monolithic design a lot more coordination is needed between developers because they're all working on the same code base uh, yeah but then i guess one of the benefits of a monolithic design is that it gives every developer the like uh, capability to make changes anywhere in the system uh, more easily so there's a little bit of a trade-off there JavaScript single page applications are, are a relatively new uh, style of developing a website where um, a lot of the code is executed on the client in the browser and uh, that code interacts directly with uh, services typically through like a REST API. So you have code that, that generates the user interface and handles uh, events like clicks and stuff. All that stuff is running on the browser instead of uh, on the back end so it kind of moves user interface concerns up toward the front. It's a similar style as to what you have to do when you're developing a mobile application where all the UI code runs on the, the phone or the tablet. Yeah. Developing a um, REST API that serves both single page applications and mobile applications leads to uh, a cross-platform design uh, that, that is very common these days where you have a single backend service or API that provides functionality that's common across all the different uh, client applications, whether it's, it's mobile or or web or, or native desktop, and the backend doesn't doesn't necessarily doesn't deal specifically with the user interface concerns. All that user interface stuff is pushed in the front end. Okay. So today's topic is load balancers, and we, we saw this before when we were talking about um, the Wikipedia architecture. So in this Wikipedia architecture, uh, the yellow donuts here are load balancers, and in this diagram we have three load balancers sitting in front of two hundred. Uh, instances of the application. Okay, so the load, load balancer is meant to be a single point of contact for a service that proxies uh, requests to uh, application servers in the background to do the work. And these load balancers do very little work. They just forward request response requests to the servers that do the work. They forward, then they relay back responses. So because they're doing much less work per request, you can have um, you can have them handle the same number of requests that a large cluster of application servers can can handle, right? Maybe uh, between two or three, or up to hundreds of different application servers potentially behind one load balancer. So the idea of a load balancer is to make make one IP address, or which is to say one machine, appear like one huge machine, and to do a lot of work. And that's what this diagram here is showing. The basic idea here of a load balancer is to make a have a cluster of servers that do the work but have them appear to the outside world like one big uh, superior server. Okay, so all the requests go to the load balancer. The load balancer, like I said before, doesn't do the work itself, but hands it off to one of the workers. It has a lot of workers in its cluster. And um, you know, the, most of the time spent on, on each request is, is, is done by the workers. There's just a little bit of time that, that the load balancer has to spend to just uh, relay the request between the client and the appropriate worker. So this makes um, this makes one 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 point of contact 
able to handle way more requests than just than a sing than it would be able to handle if it was actually running the code for the for the service. Okay. And now there's more, so, so handling more load is the main purpose of a load balancer. Um, but there are more benefits than just that. Um, of course, handling more load is just another way of saying scalability, right? And horizontal scalability in particular here. In addition to getting horizontal scalability, a load balancer um, gives us some like reliability benefits and, and, and helps us to have uh, greater uptime. So for example, if we want to update the software on our application servers, so if we like uh, developed a new version of our software and we wanted to play it, a new version of our website or whatever it is that we're uh, running, with a load balancer, um, we can uh, make that upgrade without having to like shut down the service and have an outage time. And I'm showing two different ways of doing that. One is one's called a rolling update, and the other is a synchronized update. So in the rolling update, what I'm doing is, in this case, I have five different servers running the application, and the yellow one is the old version, version one. And what I can do is, if I want to upgrade a machine, I can take it offline. So this red one is offline. The, the, as long as the load, load balancer is involved in this process, we can tell the load balancer to stop sending requests to this machine. At that point. Um, we're free to do whatever we want to, main, to maintain this machine, like reinstalling the software, rebooting the machine. We might even do something as drastic as like reinstalling the operating system. That takes something that takes a long time. In that during that time period, the system is still operating without any downtime because the load balancer is sending all the requests to these four other servers that are still running uh, normally. Right. Once we finish our upgrade here. Uh, it'll have version 1.1 of the software, and then we can tell the load balancer to, to resume sending requests to this machine. Okay, and we just do that one by one through the uh, pool of of workers. Okay, so the update rolls through the servers. So this in this diagram, the ones on the the two machines on the left, the green ones, already received the upgrade. This middle one is in the process, and these two yellow ones have yet will be the next ones to receive the upgrade. Okay, and all that happens without having any downtime. If you're if you just had one machine that was running your service and you wanted to do an update, of course you'd have to like restart at least at the very least restart the software, and during that time period your system would be down. You'd have an outage, um, which is inconvenient. And if you're running like an important website or service, uh, your customers would not be happy and would think that you're you're kind of like unprofessional, right? Another way to do this is with a synchronized update. In this case, uh, we have. Four version. We have four machines running the old version of the software, and we actually create four new virtual machines to run the new version of the software. We we load them all up at once on these um, new machines, and once all four of them are ready, at that point we tell the load balancer to switch over all at once from the old cluster to a new cluster. Okay, and still, also in this case, we have no downtime because. Um, I guess you know there's going to be a, a period of time in which the load balancer has some uh, will have some old requests in progress with the with the uh, the old version of the the software. Then all the new requests will go to the new server, but there'll be no time in which the load balancer cannot hand the request to a server that's running uh, that's up and running. Okay, so that that's a benefit uh, to uh, uptime and. Uh, that allows us to do updates more easily. In addition to that, to uh, these like planned outages, uh, load balancers can also help with unplanned problems or unplanned outages that you might have on your instances. So, uh, what the proxy can do is monitor the health of your servers by by sending uh, requests. If you program the load balancer with a particular URL, let's say that that should be uh, handled by the application and should re return a 200 OK response. The load balancer can make those requests periodically to make sure that all of the instances are uh, are working and, and none of them have crashed, or uh, whether it's a software bug or a hardware failure that caused the problem. Either way, the load balancer would know uh, using that health check uh, by just testing to see whether it got a, a 200 OK response. So if, if a request, if one of these health check requests fail, then the load balancer can auto automatically notice that the machine has crashed, shouldn't be used, and it can take that machine out of the rotation like this red machine is taken out of the rotation in this left example. Okay, so that, so this, in that way a load balancer also can give you uh, better reliability 
uh, during ongoing operations, you know, w when we know there's always a possibility that your code might have some uh, might have a bug that would cause it to, to crash. Okay. Now I want you to stop and think about these two different ways of uh, doing updates: the rolling updates and the synchronized updates. And uh, think about why you would choose one or the other. Like, what are the pr pros and cons of the two? Are there any particular situations in which one might be better than the other? Uh, what do you think? There are a couple, I think there are two different main things I would think about. Well, uh, I hope you thought about that. The thing that comes to my mind is when you look at the one on the left, what you notice is that it's kind of less expensive. Like, at any given time, you only have one extra machine that's not being used. Whereas on the right-hand side with the synchronized update, there's a point in time where you have to spin up twice as many machines as you're as you're eventually going to need, and during that time period, you have um, you're like wasting extra money on these instances that are not being used; they're being updated. So the the rolling scheme on the left is uh, more cost-effective, but the downside of of this rolling update, I guess, is that while you're rolling the up update the two different versions of your software are coexisting, right? So some users are getting version 1.1, some users are getting version 1.0, and it could be that, you're, that um, an application that's interacting with the service might have one of its uh, requests go to, one, go to the new version and then a later request go to an old version. So if, if you've done something that has made these two versions incompatible, like if the API is incompatible, and then the user might get a broken experience so I guess if you're using rolling updates, you have to be a little bit more careful about um, having compatibility between uh, the two different versions of the software because your new version is going to, there's going to be a time period, a short time period, but still a time period during which the new version is, is operating at the same time as the old version. Whereas with the synchronized updates, there's like a, a cutoff where um, all, all of a sudden your old requests are no longer, your old uh, software is not being used at all, and then everyone's using the new one. So that's better in some sense, but it's, uh, like I said, has more. it's, it's more costly to uh, set up twice as many machines before the cutover. Of course, also, I mean, it should be obvious, but once you cu cut over the machines to use the load balancer to use the new uh, instances, you would then terminate these other instances on the left-hand side, the old ones, and you'd, you know, stop paying for those if you were using a cloud computing uh, service. Okay, so that's the. Those are some basic idea or some motivation for using load balancers. The kinds of load balancers I've been talking about so far are local load balancers, the kind of load balancer that makes uh, uh, that creates a single point of contact that's very scalable and, and that defers work or proxies work to uh, other machines. There actually are two different ways of implementing this. To be honest, it's uh, how important this is to you, I think, will depend on whether how much you understand about networking. If you've taken the networking class, CS340, or you plan to t take the networking class, then um, this first kind of load balancer would make more sense to you. It's called a network address translation load balancer, or NAT load balancer. These It works at the TCP IP layer. It's also called a layer 4 load balancer. And basically the way it works is that um, each each network packet that arrives it is, is handed off to one of the uh, workers and the port numbers in the in the requests and responses are used to to associate the same um, all the packets from a single TCP stream uh, to the same worker um, and so so the so the handoff happens at a packet by packet lo uh, level so as soon as as soon as a packet arrives it can be forwarded to a uh, worker and the amount of work that's done here is pretty low. And also this is compatible with any kind of service, not just HTTP, as long as it's using um, TCP. And again, the meaning of TCP probably would not be, that probably would not be too meaningful to you unless you've taken a networking class. The other type of load balancer is a reverse proxy. And we've talked about reverse proxies already in this class. Um, when we looked at Squid, which you remember from the Wikipedia architecture, this is like an HTTP server and client that sits in the middle of an HTTP request. And actually, so in this case, it's accepting more than one packet because it's accepting the full HTTP request. It's it's relaying that to one of the workers. It's getting the full HTTP response from the worker. And once that's collected the full response, then it hands that off back to the client. So, so it's proxying at the level of an entire HTTP request or response, which is a lot of packets. Um, 
so it's it's like doing more work i would say in the load balancing but it provides some benefits because this load balancer understands http it can do things like caching and compression and also it can add um, ssl which is to say add add encryption on the front end even if the uh, worker servers on the back end are not supporting encryption and this is these these kinds of uh load balancers, reverse proxy load balancers, are like generally specific to the protocol you're used, using, which usually would be HTTP. Okay. But like the subtlety of the difference between those, like I said, really um, kind of relies on your having some networking knowledge to understand the difference. So I would say the, the NAT-based load balancer is simpler and more efficient, but it, it and it doesn't do caching, uh, but but it doesn't understand the details of HTTP and therefore it can't do things like caching and um, and adding uh, encryption. A reverse proxy load balancer is an example of that is Nginx is an open source software that, that can implement that. Uh, we also saw Squid as an example. In this case, so this diagram just shows that the request comes in, it, the request is, is fully received and handled by, it's received by um, this reverse proxy Reverse proxy chooses one of the one of the worker servers in its cluster and and constructs a similar request that se that it sends to that server. It gets a response and then it gives that response back to the client. But this happens at the level of full HTTP requests and full HTTP responses rather than packet by packet. So in case you don't know, um, you know every network's uh, the internet supports communication using packets each, each packet can be no bigger than like 1.5 kilobytes so if you're making a web request actually there are a lot of packets that are transferred and those packets together form a TCP stream um, and within that TCP stream would be an HTTP request or response yeah. but like I said there's more about that in the networking class so like I said before you can also use a reverse you can use a reverse proxy for for two things that you cannot you do with a, a NAT based load balancer. One of them is caching, like uh, Wikipedia does with Squid. Caching is nice because it um, allows you to avoid repeated work. But if you're doing caching, it also means that the load balancer is doing more work itself rather than just handing things off. It's like storing data and retrieving data. So uh, although a proxy and, cache, proxy and caching could be a good thing overall, if, you're, if it's your, your main load balancer, then that limits its scalability. So that's why we saw in the Wikipedia architecture a squid, the squid reverse proxies actually had load balancers in front of them. So it was like the request came in, went to a load balancer. From a load balancer, it went to a, a reverse proc, a caching reverse proxy. And from there, it went to another load balancer. And from there, it went, to, and from that load balancer, it went to the application server. So there are actually like four layers where the first three layers were different kinds of essentially load balancers. Uh, but for it with different purposes. The other purpose that you can, or like feature you can implement in a, in a uh, load a reverse proxy load balancer is to add encryption. So TLS and SSL are the name, is the like name for encryption uh, of web traffic. And uh, that requires a certificate, which is like a public private key pair and the associated um, signed document which, okay, again, the details of that, you kind of need to take the networking class to understand, but that only has to be configured in one place because you'd, you'd have an encrypted connection. You only need to have an encrypted connection between the person on the outside and your, your first point of contact inside. Within your own system, your own network, you could do unencrypted communication between uh, the reverse proxy and all the different workers in the pool. And that makes it a little more efficient, also reduces the amount of configuration you have to do on these servers, because these these internal servers then would not have to support encryption. They would not need these TLS SSL certificates and the private keys and stuff. Uh, so that's a little bit of a management benefit. But that's a little bit more of an advanced topic. Again, not, not super important um, that you understand the difference between these two different ki kinds of local load balancers. But I do want to mention it uh, for those that, for those that might uh, be interested in, in these details. Again, just summarizing what I've said before. The NAT-based load balancer uh, works at the TCP level. It can handle more requests. So I'm, I'm putting here the approximate scale is like one to 10 million requests per second. It, it kind of depends on the hardware and the types of requests, but that's just a ballpark figure, which I'm saying is roughly 10 times more than an HTTP reverse proxy can handle, which I'm, here I'm putting about 10,000 to 1 million requests per second. Because the reverse proxy is doing more work, it's interpreting the HTTP pr protocol 
and that allows it to do additional things like caching. Okay. You might see hardware load balancers. I mean, everything's implemented hardware, but when you see a hardware load balancer, what that typically is is a NAT-based load balancer. And also, you'll see if you're using a cloud provider, um, you can, with a few clicks, create a load balancer. Those kinds of load balancers could be either one of these, a NAT-based load balancer or a reverse proxy load balancer. Or a combination of the two <laughs> so it really depends on the on the cloud and also depends on the options you select like with Amazon web services you can get either one depending on, on, on whether you choose uh, whether you want an application level protocol or a TCP level protocol uh, uh, load balancer application level load balancer or TCP level load balancer okay so again just to review those lo local load balancers we've been looking at so far are like points of contact where the requests from all from all your clients can go to where they are handed off to a bunch of workers to do the work but you have a lot of workers who are doing the hard work of generating the responses but you have a single point of contact that is um, just handing things off like in a proxying manner what are the can you th I want you to stop and think about what limitations there might be to this kind of scheme. Okay. I showed there were a lot of benefits, but um, and it, that it gives you some scalability, but what are the limitations? Well, after thinking about that, I hope that maybe you came to the conclusion that this kind of it does that this these kinds of load balancers provide some scalability, but they don't provide unlimited scalability. You still have a single point of failure and a single bottleneck, right? All your requests are going to one machine. Now, by having other machines that are doing the majority of the work for each request, we've allowed those single uh, points of contact to have to be able to handle, like, let's say, a million requests per second, which is a lot. But you can't have an unlimited capacity on those load balancers. They're still they still are a single machine where all the requests are flowing to. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a single point of failure also in terms of reliability. That's a problem, right? If that machine goes down, for whatever reason, your whole system is down. So it's bad for um, reliability. Uh, and it lim it's, it's not an unlimited uh, scalability solution. So if you have a really huge service, you need more than just local load balancers. Because... Um, you don't want to rely on that, on that single point of failure and single uh, bottleneck. So what we want is some kind of a distributed solution to, han to handling traffic. And what this turns out to be a service discovery problem. We want clients, like all of our, our, our customers and users, to find a service replica without contacting a, a central bottleneck. Before, you know, with the local load balancers, they were all contacting a central machine which would relay the request to one of many replicas uh, but that that when that becomes a bottleneck you need some other way of um, service discovery okay. and I'm going to talk about two different ways of doing that uh, so in general we're going to call these global load balancing and you know this is not an alternative to local load balancing I mean in some sense it is but in, in practice usually it's combined with local load balancing so the first uh, type of global load balancing, which is a, a service discovery system, is going to be based on DNS, or domain name service. And again, this is going to be one of those things where having the networking class done would help you, uh, or the other way of looking at it is that this would give you a taste of what you'd see in the networking class. So this lecture in particular is kind of packed with stuff uh, that's network related, uh, more so than any of the other uh, lectures. Anyway, so uh, DNS, in case you don't know, is a distributed service, it's like a directory that's that's d implemented on machines all around the world that maps from host names to IP addresses. So when you navigate the web, you use these uh, addresses like you know google.com, northwestern.edu. Those are user-friendly names for services. Those have to be mapped to IP addresses because IP addresses are like the locations of the machines on the internet. IP addresses are what's used, uh, what the network uses to get a packet to its destination, which is to say to, to get your data to another machine, you need to know that machine's IP address. So if you want to make a request to fetch a document, you need to construct a request that's sent to that IP address. Okay. So DNS, not going to go into a ton of details, but DNS uses a distributed hierarchical architecture that has caching, so it's actually quite scalable. Um, and uh, 
So for example, depending on where you are, your DNS queries go to different servers. When I, when I say DNS query, I mean when you're asking what is the IP address of a certain host name, okay? And so local DNS resolvers, like the, the DNS server at, on, on Northwestern's campus, they can make the system efficient by caching because a lot of users are contacting the same services. Like you have a lot of users that are going to gmail.com and facebook.com, northwestern.edu on campus. So, so uh, that local DNS resolver can store an answer to all those questions. In other words, store the IP addresses for all those uh, common websites or host names, I should say, and give those responses immediately without having to ask centrally uh, for example, without having to ask Google what is the IP address of gmail.com or having to ask Facebook what its IP addresses are. Okay, So this kind of distributes the work. That's why we say it's hierarchical and distributed. So DNS distributes the work of giving answers to the edge of the system that's distributed around the world. Um, yeah, There's a hierarchy of, of information, of directories that you can use to get the information. But I, I don't. It's not worth getting into the details here. Um, that's really a topic for the networking class. Okay. Like I said, yeah, intro to networking, CS340 covers that in detail. So, um, just as a point of interest, uh, you might think that the domain name service is a single point of failure and perhaps a point of vulnerability for the internet. And it's been surprisingly reliable, but actually, yes, it, it can cause problems. Like on October 22nd, 2019, um, Amazon Web Services had a huge outage that affected uh, just tons and tons of websites stopped working and other services stopped working because they were using AWS. And the reason for that was a, 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 a denial, distributed denial of service attack on Amazon's uh, DNS servers, which prevented it from distributing information about its IP addresses to the rest of the world. And so therefore, um, you know, users could not contact its services. Okay. So the way DNS is used for load balancing in the simplest way is called round robin DNS. And this is by giving back multiple IP addresses for each one of these DNS queries. Okay, so when the client asks, what's the IP address for uh, facebook.com, let's say, what we have is a DNS server that gives back not just one IP address, but lots of IP addresses, let's say 10 different IP addresses. And then the client can look at those 10 and randomly choose one. Or even better, the DNS server could, you know, internally have a long list of IP addresses that are running, any, you know, the purpose of these multiple IP addresses, remember this is load balancing, so we have a bunch of clones of the service that are running the same application, they all have different IP addresses. Uh, and we give the user one of those IP addresses so they contact um, one of the clones of the service. Okay? So the server can internally have many answers, many IP addresses, but then give, a, give, them, give out responses and, um, like in randomly or by going cyclically by going through a list and like kind of like cycling through to different answers. Right? Um, there's, because of the caching, the effect this has can be... Um, not uneven so like the northwestern's campus dns resolver might have been told by google that, that google's ip address is this number and then that would mean that northwestern's campus resolver would be, give this particular ip address to its users to the people on campus a different campus like u chicago might have when it asked google recently uh, for its ip address might have gotten a different number and then this different number would be repeated in that location on that campus um, but that's fine because then you have two big chunks of users that are going to different IP addresses. Yeah. Now, um, usually though, so you can use round robin DNS for load balancing and use it as your only solution for load balancing. But typically, you would combine this with those local load balancers I was talking before that were like physical machines that proxied requests. So like these IP addresses I'm showing here which are answers for the requests that, for particular domains like google.com, usually these IP addresses actually correspond to load balancers themselves. So like reverse proxying load balancers uh, or NAT-based load balancers. So you have at the DNS level, users getting sent to different IP addresses depending on when they ask, right? And But then when the user goes to the IP address, that in turn would is behind the scenes being proxied to one of several different workers. So you have two different levels of load balancing here. All right, so to help us uh, 
not lose track of what's happening here, I want you to stop and think about whether there is a limit to the kind of the, the level of scaling you can get by DNS. So this DNS-based load balancing, um, can you, at what point might it become overwhelmed, or would it not become overwhelmed? Uh, stop and think about that. Now, this this is one of those things that I think you do need a networking class maybe to to be confident about this answer. But it turns out there's not a limit here uh, because the clients are not contacting any single place to get these DNS answers. DNS is a distributed system. Every every location, every internet service provider, every campus or big office that has its own network, they'll have their own DNS uh, uh, server that's a, a caching resolver that will uh, give answers. So, so there's no central place that has to um, store uh, these IP addresses and therefore, I mean, there is a central place that stores the IP addresses, the authoritative servers, but those don't have to be asked every single time a user makes a request because of the caching at the edge and the hierarchical uh, design. Okay. Now, an even cooler thing we can do with DNS for load balancing is geographic load balancing. Okay. So uh, instead of just using DNS to balance load, like to have more than one IP address that we're going to cycle through to give to direct users to our service. What we can do is be a little more clever about it and choose the cl have our service running all over the world. So those different IP addresses for my service could represent machines that are in different locations. And when a request comes in, when a user asks, what is your IP address? I can choose not just randomly from among all my IP addresses that are clones of the service, but choose the one that is closest to the user. Okay, that's geographic load balancer in a nutshell. So what you have are clever DNS servers Instead of just have instead of those DNS servers just having a list of IP addresses that they're going to cycle through, they they know the location of their D, of the different IP addresses they're storing, and they also have a way of looking at the client requests, the IP address of those requests, and figuring out um, what location that user is at, and 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 who, which of the servers I have is closest to that location. Okay, so that's called IP address geolocation. Um, there are services you can use, um, like MaxMind is a company that has an oh, that provides the service, like uh, telling you what location on the in the world uh, approximately an IP address corresponds to. So um, that's particularly useful for DNS. Okay, because so because if you send a user to a machine that's nearby, they're going to get a better experience because um, the the speed of light is a limiting factor for communication anywhere, right? And, and that's actually particularly important on the internet. So if you want to send a message all the way to the other side of the world, the latency for that, if you're using a light beam, which is the fastest you can travel, is about 150 milliseconds, I think. So the round trip latency uh, is going to be noticeable. Okay, so if you're contacting a machine that's all the way across the world, as opposed to contacting a machine that's like in the same state or the same city, you're going to get a dramatically different level of performance. Okay. So that's why that's why we use geographic load balancing. Okay. So I'll show you I want to show you a little demo here of how um, geographic load balancing with DNS works. So what I'm going to bring up is a little uh, command line here. So NS lookup is a tool that, that lets you do DNS queries. So if I if I want to do if I do NSLOOKUP for google.com, okay, so here, here's the command I just ran. Okay, so it's telling me that google.com's email address, or sorry, IP address is 172.217.0.14. Uh, if I run it one more time, I'll get the same answer. I ran it a third time, I got a different answer. Okay, so, and yet a different answer. Uh, yet a, and then back to the second answer second answer, and then a uh, fourth answer, okay? So I ran the, the, the query several times, uh, and I got several different answers. So there's some kind of load balancing happening locally. But there also is a difference uh, when I uh, connect from a different location. I'm making these requests from Illinois. If I log into another machine, so this, this uh, stevetarzy.com machine is actually in Oregon. And from here, I run the same command. 
I get different answers. And actually, you notice that the answers I get are starting with a totally different set of numbers. So these addresses, the ones I got before were all like 172 dot something. Now when I query from Oregon, I'm getting answers that are like 218 dot something. So they're, they're kind of totally different numbers. They're not machines that are in the same, that have similar addresses, but totally different ones. Actually, I keep getting the same one over and over again. I also can connect to a machine in, um, in Virginia. It's on the East Coast. Let's see. And here I can uh, run the same thing. And I'm getting a yet different prefix on this IP address. So this is another um, IP address is probably in a totally different location. Okay. So geographic load balancing um, one of the best ways to take advantage of that, and the easiest ways to take advantage of that, is by using a content delivery network. So content delivery networks are um, services provided uh, by companies that combine two different very useful services. So geographic load balancing and HTTP reverse proxy, and caching HTTP reverse proxies. So remember, caching reverse proxy stores resp responses to reuse them. Like that's what Squid was doing in Wikipedia's uh, architecture. What, what a CDN does is that, plus it has the replicas in different locations around the world, and it, redirect, it directs users to the closest replica to them. Okay, so the, Akamai was the company that kind of uh, innovated this idea uh, a long time ago, uh, maybe 15 years ago, something like that. Cloudflare, Crowd, CloudFront, and Fastly are other companies that do the same thing, or other services do the same thing. Um, CloudFront is actually a service of Amazon, and Cloudflare and Fastly are companies that, that, like Akamai, are dedicated to this uh, particular service. And so these companies have to like run, have to maintain servers in lots of different locations, as many locations as possible, so that the users uh, can be can have their requests handled by a machine that's really close by to them, without having to send all the requests to like one location. Wikipedia tries to save some money, so they run their own servers. I think they have them in two locations, Florida and somewhere in Europe. I forget where. Okay. So we've already seen HTTP reverse proxies, caching reverse proxies, but this is just another picture that illustrates the same idea that we saw in that proxying lecture. So uh, we have an origin server, which is like the application that, that is capable of generating the responses. And then we have a, have caching proxies in front, and we have a lot of them, and they're in different locations around the world. We call those edge locations because by edge we mean uh, close to the user, we have the, and we have the users um, all around them in, in this diagram. When the user makes a request, they get sent to their closest edge location, and hopefully that edge location has a copy of the uh, document that they requested. Like that's what's shown in the second request example here. It makes the uh, an HTTP request is made to an edge server and it, it gives a response immediately. But if not, the first uh, case here is, is an example of that. The edge server has to make a request to the origin server to get the document first. In this case, it was an, an image. And then it can it can store that for later use and send that back to the client. The second time, it gets the same request and give the response. Okay. So uh, again, this is a repeat of the of a review of the idea of, of HTTP caching proxies. But the new thing here is, is that we're, we're calling it a CDN because it's not just an HTTP caching reverse proxy, but one that has the caching proxies located all over the world and is using uh, geographic DNS to send users to the closest location, the closest uh, replica of the cache. There are cache control headers in the HTTP responses that allow you to use the, a, a CDN or any kind of caching proxy, even though some of your content might be cacheable and other content may not be cacheable. So you can actually, as an origin server, you can decide the policy for allowing things to be cached. Okay, then cache control headers do that. I have a slide that shows that um, in a second. Okay, now notice that as an application developer, you're developing the origin server in the middle, and this the edge servers, the CDN, is managed by the CDN, and the CDN is some third-party service. I mean, you—it's very rare that you would be you would deploy your own CDN unless you're a huge company. Um, that's why there are so many companies that specialize in this, because again, it requires that you have machines in like dozens of locations all around the world, and that's a, that re requires a lot of um, 
that's that's really complicated and, and most people most companies don't want to do that themselves it's a kind of generic service um, once you have a network of machines all over the world that are implementing HTTP reverse proxies, you can reuse that same exact infrastructure for lots of different websites, and it all kind of works the same because it's all using HTTP protocol, right? So it's a great business model. Um, it's a great thing to outsource to a company that specializes in that. Right. Okay, so I said cache control headers allow HTTP responses, allow the server to control what's cached. Um, so I can give an example of that. So I have four different URLs for four different HTTP requests. Some of them are cache. Some of them are are cacheable, and some of them are not. And they have different cache control headers to to control that. So to show you an example, and I can use, I'm going to use the command line here again to show you. So I'm using the curl command with um, the command I'm sending or that I'm running is. Uh, here. I'm using the dash V flag to make it verbose so it shows the headers and I'm spit, I'm actually throwing the HTML response in the garbage here. I'm, I'm, I don't want to see the response. I'm just interested in the headers. Okay, so that's what this command here does. There's some debug information about the, the encryption, but then here you see my request. So this is, looks like a basic HTTP header and the response comes back here and there's a lot of there, there are several headers, a lot of headers here, like setting cookies and stuff that we don't need to worry about. The main thing I want you to focus on, though, is the uh, cache control and expires headers. So cache control is the main one, actually. Um, this is telling the client that made this request that this the data that's being sent has a max age of, should be cached for at most zero seconds. Uh, so therefore, it's not cacheable. Okay. So Remember, this was Google.com, the homepage. So Google does not want its homepage to be cached. There are other parts of the uh, Google site that it will allow caching on. So this, this URL here corresponds to the logo at Google.com. If I copy that, um, or if I click that, so th this is the image here. This image, though, uh, if we look at the headers that are returned when I request. So I'm doing another curl request here to, to fetch that document. In this case, the response I get is different. It, uh, it's actually allowing caching. So this cache control header has max age equal to some huge number. If you do the math on this, this is one year expressed in seconds. Okay. So Google has con configured its server, its, its web server to, for some pages, um, not allow caching, but for other pages allow caching. Now obviously caching a logo makes a lot more sense than caching uh, the page itself. Like this home page changes every day they, they have a new like they sometimes have new like doodles and like little like promotions and stuff on their home page. So you want users to get the most up-to-date version of the home page maybe. The logo is not going to change. So so uh, I mean it could change but in this case they're they're allowing it to stay the same for up to one year in a cache. The Northwestern homepage has the same kind of thing. For the homepage itself, there's no caching allowed, but for the Northwestern logo on the homepage, there's caching allowed for up to uh, one day. Sorry, not one hour, one day. This 86,400 is, uh, is 24 hours. Okay, so that was uh, content delivery networks and HTTP caching. In more detail, so there is one other way of doing uh, geographic load balancing, different than DNS, which is called IP AnyCast. And again, this is one of those things that uh, the networking class would let you understand in full detail. But I'm just going to breeze through it quickly. Uh, what this is, it's a way of, of having one IP address that um, actually maps to many machines. Okay, so one example of this is Google's public DNS service. 8.8.8.8 .8 is the IP address for Google, Google's public DNS service. Um, a lot of people use this. It gets about 5 million queries per second, so that's a lot of traffic. Some of you might use it if you've ever uh, entered this, this number into your IP configuration. Now, um, 
do any i might i mean you can stop and i'd be curious to know if any of you use it. if we were in class i would at, live i would ask that and see a show of hands usually there are a few people who have used it but um we can't rely on dns for load balancing of this because it's, it what we're what we're providing is a dns service itself so the purpose of this is to give dns answers we can't so we're not we can't use dns for load balancing um IP Anycast is, is, is used here for load balancing. What IP Anycast does is basically it has it causes a bunch of routers around the world. So in this case, it's, we're talking about Google. Google has routers all over the world because um, it has data centers all over the world. Those routers advertise to their neighbors that they can reach this IP address in just one hop. This is through the BGP protocol, which is covered in the networking class. So um, any neighbor of Google throughout the world, no matter for all of its locations, all those neighbors think that it's a good choice to, through B, this BGP protocol, to send packets that should go to 8.8.8.8 .8 to that nearby Google router. Okay. So, um, so these routers all over the world from Google attract traffic from 8.8.8.8 .8 and they have their own rules that forward that the, that to different machines in different locations. So, um, this this technically violates the principle that IP addresses correspond to particular locations in the network and that might cause TCP connections to break but DNS is, is UDP based uh, so it, it only like everything fits into one packet so it doesn't matter if like one message goes to one location and another one goes to a different location that's really the downside of using this, this style of, of load balancing um, so that works okay but again and I'm not expecting you to fully understand that I'm just uh, kind of expressing two different showing you two different ways of doing global load balancing the first one was DNS. The second one I just introduced was IP Anycast, and that second way uses BGP instead of DNS to do the routing to like direct users to the, to the uh, closest replica. Both of those are really scalable. They're scalable as the internet itself. There's no fundamental limiting factor. There's no central uh, bottleneck. There's no one machine that's involved in every request. The IP Anycast is actually better in some sense because um, there's less caching, so you can actually make changes more quickly. Um, DNS, because it's a distributed cache system, you, old old answers can get out of date, can, can be stored for, for minutes or hours, meaning that um, if you need to take one of your IP addresses out of the rotation from, from DNS, it, it could uh, you can't do that instantly. But in order to use IP Anycast, and, and use BGP for load balancing, you have to be operating your own autonomous system, which basically means you need to be an internet service provider, a huge tech company. So huge tech companies or you know network specializing tech companies can do IP anycast based load balancing, but otherwise um, DNS is the way to go. But also for a typical user though, if you're gonna, the way that you would typically use global load balancing is by using a content delivery network. It's because it, again, it combines global load balancing with a caching proxy. Okay. Now that we've covered global load balancing, we can step back and compare the local load, local load balancing and global load balancing. And again, these are usually used together for two different purposes, right? So the purpose of local load balancing was um, to make have have a single point of contact, like one machine, one IP address, that's able to handle a lot more than one machine can actually handle itself by having a bunch of workers that it, that it proxies work to. Okay, so it's, it's limited in scalability because it's still just one machine, but it's like simple, it's available off the shelf, and it also can allow you to can make changes really quickly, like that load balancer can be uh, instantly configured to send traffic to a different set of machines. So these local load balancers are really good for um, providing continuous operation, like, like with those health checks and when you're doing rolling updates of software, keeping the system um, up without any downtime. And doing scaling at the within a data center where you're talking about um, having tens of machines or hundreds of machines. Okay. Global load balancer, global load balancing, include whether it's by DNS or BGP. That's also common, but for much bigger services that have that global scale, where a single, they want to have more than just one data center. They want to send users to the to the nearest data center, and they can't have a single uh, load balancer that is handling all their traffic. Okay, but there, it's more complex to set up. But again, you can achieve some of that benefit even as a, as a very uh, entry-level user by using a content delivery network. So like, for example, the National Gun Violence Memorial website that I run, 
uh, I'm using a content delivery network for uh, some, for a lot of the content, like the uh, feeds and the homepage and, and images and stuff. Um, and that's that's very easy to do. You just have to set the content, the cache control headers in your origin server, and and configure your a DNS domain name to point to the content delivery network and have that configure that to point to your origin. It's like a something you can do in like a, a couple hours. Okay. So that, that, that's it for today. Today's topic was load balancers. And this is pretty exciting because we've covered um, quite a lot of the, of the things we need to know for scalable architectures. So in some sense, it's like two-thirds of the end-to-end -end view of, of basic scalable architectures. We'll get into more details, more advanced stuff later, of course. But we've covered, uh, we finally have covered the front end pretty well. So at the front end, to make a system scalable, and when we talk about scalable here, we really mean horizontally scalable. Uh, a client has to connect to the service somehow. It does that connection, makes that connection through a load balancer. Okay, um, the client is is being directed to one of many copies of a service. That can happen at a global level through DNS or IP AnyCast, which allows unlimited scale because there's no central bottleneck, and also allows you to optimize performance to send users by sending users to the near, nearest replica if you have uh, presence all over the world. There also are load, local load balancers that give you um, a decent amount of scaling, not 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 scaling in an unlimited way, but up to like tens or hundreds of machines, and also importantly, continuous operation by allowing um, you to take machines in and out of the cluster as needed uh, very quickly. Okay, so that's that's that the front end of scalability is really um, managed by load balancers and and having clones now. The when we build the services, that kind of middle layer of the system, we also we achieve scalability by making them stateless and implementing uh, deploying the service on lots of clones. Okay, that's only possible if we have a, some kind of front end in the front that can some kind of load balancer that can direct users to to one of the replicas. Okay, so those two really work together. What we've not talked about yet really is data storage and how to make that scalable. That's a huge topic. And we'll devote almost half the class to that coming up next. And um, yeah, but for now, you should have a, a, a pretty good sense of a lot of what's going into scalable architectures. Uh, yeah, except we'll come to data storage next. All right, hope that was useful. See you later.